Hi, friends. This is Jessica Lopez, and I'm going to go ahead and cover the 2415 Cal 3 um, Unit 1 review. Okay. So I have already clicked on it in the course modules. So here it is. Um, it says there's 102 parts. But if you notice, like some of the problems have multiple parts. So it does not mean that there's 122 questions. If I scroll over, there's actually 42 questions. So I may need to cut this video into two parts, but we'll just go through it and then see where it goes. And if the time does go um, close or over to an hour, then I will definitely separate it into two parts. Of course, you're always welcome to fast forward and um, rewind as much as you need to so that you can get to the problems that you're having difficulty with when you do the review yourself, okay? The review is part of your unit one um, web assign assignment average. So just like the homework, it's going to be calculated in that average, okay? And it is a really good um, help on how to determine what is going to be on the test okay because although there's 42 questions here excuse me not all of them will be on the test um but it's possible usually my tests are anywhere from 10 to 20 questions okay it just depends on the level of difficulty of the questions how long it takes to do those questions um because i don't want a test to ever last longer than an hour and a half um two hours max so usually I try to time them within an hour and a half. And when I do that, that means that I need to take the test within 30 minutes, okay? Um, so I will just go through these. Now it's different when I'm doing problems on record versus when I'm just doing problems on my own. Because when I'm recording, I write everything out. I have to explain every single step and it really takes a long time. Whereas if I'm taking the steps, if I'm taking the test, um, usually, especially algebraic um, stuff and Cal 1 rules, I don't necessarily always write out every single line. Um, at some points, I do have to write out a line so that I know where I'm at and before I keep going. Um, but I don't need to write out as much as I write out. So I typically, when I take the tests, I do go faster than when I'm recording videos for reference purposes, okay? Because those have to be a little more thorough. So for the question one, it's gonna take us all the way back to 11.1. .1. And um, this is an 11.1 topic. You can kind of tell by the numbering system up at the top. Um, and if you were to go look at the textbook, this would be a problem similar to number 12 inside the textbook, okay? So that's where the numbering system comes from. So, Looking at this, it's telling me um, to graph a vector that has initial point of 0, negative 3, and terminal point of negative 3, 1. So just for that, if I'm going to be going from 0 to negative 3, 2, negative 3, negative 1, what is that going to look like in the graph? 1, 2, 3, um, and 1. It's basically taking a vector that starts here with its initial point, and then ends here. So it's basically going toward the left, okay? Um, oh, it says, oh, I forgot that wrong actually. I swapped these for some reason. So my initial point was graphed correctly, but then my terminal point should have been negative three and negative one, so here. So that's where my arrow will go. There we go, that's a little bit better. Okay, so I should have a vector starting down at the below the x axis on top of the y axis, and then it should be going up and to the left. Now, as far as the graphs are concerned, the two on the right look the closest, but if you notice, this one has an initial point at zero, negative three. Whereas this one has an initial point of zero, negative four. So it's definitely not this bottom right. It's gotta be the top right. Now that's for part A. For part B, it asked me to write the vector in component form. So in order for me to do that, I'm going to essentially subtract the terminal coordinate 
minus the initial coordinate. And then for the second component, it's the same thing. The terminal com uh, component minus the initial. And so I end up with negative three comma positive two. And so then part C says to write the, the vector as a linear combination of the standard unit vectors. So instead of writing V in its component form, we're gonna write negative three vector I plus two vector J. And then it says for part D for us to sketch the graph in its initial position. So if it's going this way, that's gonna be zero. I'm gonna use this. So a standard position means it starts at the origin and then it ends according to the components here. So negative three and two. So then my vector is starting at the origin and going to that point at negative three, two. So it definitely will not be the two on the right. It's gotta be one of the two in, on the left. And then I just need to make sure that I'm going negative three and two. This one's too high. Negative three and two, this one's just right. So it's the bottom left graph. Now let's submit that just to verify. Okay, well, I forgot to type this in here, so that's why it didn't give me all of my checks. But if I do type that, and the V vectors, so we've got negative three, and then vector I plus two vector J. Here we go, and we can submit it again to make sure that it's correct. Okay, we do have all four checks, so good for that one. Now for number two, I'm gonna write down these vectors, U and V. And we want to do some computations here. So we're gonna do two thirds U, which essentially just means two thirds times the vector seven, nine, which means, um, two thirds times seven, and then two thirds times nine. So you have to be very careful with using these dots when we're talking about vectors, because with vectors, that dot means something different, right? Um, here, I'm gonna get 14 over three. And then here, I'm going to get six. And so this is my response for part A. 14 over three comma six. Now for part B, we're doing three V, which means three times five negative four, which means three times each component. So I get 15 comma negative 12. And then for part C, we've got V minus U. Oops. So that's going to be five negative four, take away U, which is seven, nine. So essentially I'm gonna be doing five, take away seven, and then negative four, take away nine. You've gotta be respective with, um, with those coordinates, um, the components, first components and second components. So this is gonna give me negative two and negative 13. Okay, and then finally part D, which is two U plus five V. So you're going to do two times U plus five times V. 14 and 18 plus 25 and negative 20. So if I add the uh, first components together, that'll give me 39. And if I add the second components together, I will get negative two. So for this last one, oops, we have 39 comma 
negative two. Oops, not point two, just two. And all green checks. Okay, moving on. So number three has got u equal to zero, one, and v equal to three, negative four. So here we're just going to be finding a bunch of magnitudes. I could tell you right now, I already know the answer for d and e. And there's nothing really to write down. And f, nothing to write down. And I'll explain why. Um, if I saw that on the test, all I would have to say is that a vector over its magnitude is by definition a unit vector. And also by definition, the length of a unit vector is one unit. So I already know that if I'm putting the magnitude of this unit vector, that is the length of the unit vector, which I already know to be one. So there's literally no sense in working anything out for D, E, and F. Um, they're already just using logic, you can figure it out, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the magnitude of u, because that we can do. We get the square root of zero squared plus one squared, which is the square root of one, which is just one. Then we're gonna take the magnitude of v, which is three squared and negative four squared which is nine plus 16, which is the square root of 25, which is five. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. So we'll type in one and five. Um, however, for part C, so this is part A, this is part B. Part C is the magnitude of U plus V, which means I definitely need to figure out what U plus V is. And then um, that would be zero plus three is three, one plus negative four is negative three. And so then when I take the square root, that would be, three squared, which is nine, plus negative three squared, which is another positive nine. Um, so you get the square root of 18, which is three square root of two. So this response would be three square root of two. And again, D, E, and F would all be one because you're basically finding the magnitude of a unit vector. And by definition, we already know that that magnitude is one. So let's check them. Okay, and then I was just writing the sentence of what I was saying verbally. Um, number four, let's see what we got here. This one says, find the component form and magnitude of a vector V with the given initial and terminal points, then find a unit vector in the direction of V. So V would be determined by the terminal coordinate minus the initial coordinate respectively. So four minus two, one minus two, and four minus zero. So V can be written as two, negative one, and four. Then the magnitude of V is going to be the square root of two squared, which is four, plus one squared, which is one, plus four squared, which is 16. So that's 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So the square root of 21. And then the last one is to find the unit vector in the direction of V. So we take V, and we divide it by its magnitude, which essentially gives me two over 21, square root of 21, negative one over square root of 21, and then four over the square root of 21. Okay, so let's type all of this in there. So we've got 
two comma negative one comma um, four. Then for the magnitude, we have square root of 21. And then for the unit vector, we have two over symbols, oh, not symbols, operations, square root of 21 comma negative one over square root of 21 comma four over square root of 21 and submit and we'll see if we get this one correct So for number five, it says find the vector z given that u equals this, v equals this, and w equals this. And we basically have to solve that equation. So I'm going to take that equation and instead of writing u, v, and w, I'm going to write what u, v, and w are. So in this case, u is 15, 3, and 8. The rest of the equation says plus v, which is 4, 2, negative 4. And then minus W, which is 4, 8, negative 6, plus 3Z, which is a vector, equal to 0. And this should be a vector. I know it has 0 and it does not, it's not in bold, but it should be. Because when you add a bunch of, add or subtract a bunch of vectors together, you end up with another vector. So this should, for no reason, be a scalar 0. It should be the vector 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. So let's see, we're going to get um, 36, 16. And then we could put these two together. So we get 34, 6, and 12. And then we can put these together. 34 minus 4 is 30. 6 minus 8 is negative 2. 12, negative, negative. So 12 plus 6 would be 18. And then if I subtract this vector on both sides of the equation, These would cancel 30 minus 30, 0. Negative 2 minus a negative 2 is 0. 18 minus 18 is 0. So all I have is this positive 3z. And then 0 minus 30 is negative 30. 0 minus negative 2 is positive 2. And 0 minus 18 is negative 18. So then if I'm going to do this, I'm going to multiply by 1 third on both sides. So the three cancels and I just get Z equals one third of negative 30 is 10. One third of two is two thirds. And then one third of negative 18 is negative six. And so we get this vector here. And I apologize. I did not realize that my work was not on the camera. So after I combined those two together, I did subtract and I got this vector. Then I subtracted this vector on both sides and that resulted in 3z equal to this vector. And then in order to solve for z, I multiplied by 1 third on both sides of the equation, and I ended up with this result. So we will check it. Um, let's see, let's see, vector notation. And we have negative 10 comma two thirds, comma negative six. I think that is good, but let's make sure. Oh, nope, I've got an error. Oh, I have a typo in there, not necessarily an error. Let's try again, maybe that'll work. Still wrong. Okay, let's go see what happens. So 15, 2, 
times 15, 3, 8, plus 4, 2, negative 4, minus 4, 8, negative 6, plus 3z. So let's go look at this again. When we multiplied the 2 first, we did multiply this. We got 30, 6, and 16. When we combine these two together, we got 34. We got, oh, I see my mistake. This is 8. And then that is 12. And then this all came down. And then 34 minus 4 is 30. 8 minus 8 is actually 0. And then 12 minus a negative 6 is actually 12 plus 6, which is 18. So then when I'm subtracting, I want to subtract this whole vector. So I should be subtracting 30, 0, 18. But 0 minus 0 will still cancel. So I should be subtracting 30, 0, 18. OK, so 0 minus 0 would still be a 0. And when I multiply 0 by 1 third, I will still get a 0. So let's go in here and put that second component as a zero. Let's try again. And just FYI, when you take the test, um, if you choose to not turn in your paperwork, then if your answer is incorrect, you get zero points for that problem. Even if I had done all of this work, but the fact that when I entered it in, one, first I had a typo, and then the second time, the middle term was wrong. Everything about my work is perfect. The only thing that was wrong is that I made one small arithmetic error here, which threw off the middle con um, component throughout the rest of the problem. But that is the precise reason why you would want to turn in your paperwork, because if I see that, I see that you know what you're doing. You just made a small computational error. Um, I can give you back most of the points for that particular problem. Let's say if the problem was worth um, five points, you would get four out of those five points. Versus if you chose not to turn in the paperwork and you got it wrong, you get zero, regardless of why it was wrong. Because I can't tell why you got it wrong when all I see is what you answered, okay? so. Just letting you know, I mean, it's completely up to you, but if it were me, I'd be trying to maximize the number of points that I earn. And so I would be turning in my paperwork, but it is completely up to you whether you want to do that, okay? It is optional. I used to make it required, but then I would get a lot of people complaining about how I graded. Um, and so now I've just made it, um, I've just made it, Um, oh, that's so much better. It doesn't do all that little weird adjusting. That's great. Um, but I wouldn't put it all in the hands of Canvas and hope that I'm going to get everything correct and perfect, especially when you're under the anxiety of taking a test, right? You're already under a lot of pressure, like there's a clock running. Um, and I've got to demonstrate that I know this stuff, right? It, it's very nerve wracking already. Um, and then trying to maximize points is, is an issue, okay? Let's turn this so that I'm not having to lean over every time. Um, but if I'm gonna turn that, then I need to turn this back. There we go, much better. Okay, so that means I've got U and V. And then let's see what they want me to do. Oh, they want me to do some dot products here. So for part A, I'm gonna do u dot v, which basically means this guy dot product with this guy. So the Rule for dot product is to multiply corresponding components. So that I get negative 42 plus negative 27 plus negative 64, which is equal to, I don't know. 
negative 42 minus 27 minus 64 is negative 133. So that's what I'm gonna type in here. Now u dot with u. Well, essentially that's gonna be each of these components multiplied with themselves. So I'm gonna get 36 plus 81 plus 64. And I get 181. Now for C, I have the magnitude of u squared. Remember the um, magnitude u squared is the same as the square root of each component squared, squared. So this will undo each other. So I will just get the negative six squared, the nine squared, and then the negative eight squared. So I get the same 181. And then now here, this one's interesting. I have to do u dot v times v. So I've already done u dot v, there's no sense in doing extra work. So this is essentially negative 133 times v. So negative 133 times seven, negative 133 times three, negative three, so it's positive 399, negative 133 times eight is negative 1064. And so let's type in that, and that is a vector. So negative 931, comma, 399, comma, negative 1064. And then finally, we're gonna do part E, which is u dot 2v. So u is this dot 2v would be 14, negative 6, and 16, two times each of the v components. So then negative 6 times 14 is negative 84. 9 times negative 6 is negative 54, plus negative 8 times 16 is negative 128. And so what do I end up with? Negative 84 minus 54 minus 128. I get negative 266. Okay. Let's check this one, make sure everything is good. Yes, all good. Okay, so now we're moving on to number seven. So number seven is asking us, let me first put these in component form. So U is eight I and one J and V is negative seven I and positive nine J. And so they want the angle in between the two vectors in radians and then in the degrees. So it just means a matter of how I have my calculator. Since for part A is in radians, I'm gonna leave my calculator in radian mode. And I'm gonna use the formula cosine of theta equals um, u dot v over the magnitude of u and the magnitude of v, okay? So in that case, that means eight times negative seven, which is negative 56, plus one times nine, which is nine, over the square root of 64 plus one and the square root of 49 plus 81. So negative 56 plus nine is negative 47. You have the square root of 65 and the square root of 130. Notice that this is 65 times two. So I've got 265, so that'll come out, but the two will stay inside. And then this is, if I wanna know the angle though, I have to do cosine inverse of this value. Okay, 
So I'm going to go with my calculator and we're going to do cosine inverse of fraction negative 47 over 65 square root of 2. Get out, close it, and hit enter. Now my calculator is in radian mode. So in radians, that's about 2. Point, what does it say around two? Three decimals, 107. Now, if I want it in degree mode, I have to put my calculator in degree mode. Then I can go highlight that entry again. And I have that it's also about 120.75 degrees. Because this nine will make this nine go up to 10, which makes that four go up to five. Okay, so it becomes 0.75. Let's try this in here, 2.107, and then 120.75. Okay, yay. now moving on to number eight, again, we have a lot of these, right? <laughs> Definitely a lot. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, well, I was checking to see if I could tell how long it's been recording, but I cannot tell in this version of Zoom that I have here. So number eight has two vectors. I'm going to write them in their component form. So zero i's, one j, and eight k's. And for v, we have one i, negative five j's, and negative one k. And they're asking me to determine whether they're orthogonal, parallel, or neither. Now I know for sure that they're not parallel. Because in order for you to be parallel, one of these vectors has to be um, a scalar multiple of the other, meaning u does need to equal some number times v, OK? And that's not going to happen because it doesn't matter what number. Just looking at the first component, it doesn't matter what I multiply this one component by, I will never get 1. Everything times 0 is 0, OK? So even though I could multiply this by a negative 5 or multiply this by a negative 1 8, in order for me to be parallel, it has to be the same constant times all of the components in the vector v that will give me all of the components in vector u. So the fact that I have to multiply by different things in the last two is another indicator that there is no, this thing is not parallel. So my u will not equal a scalar multiple of v which means that u and v are not parallel. Now, the other thing to check is if they're orthogonal. So then we do the dot product, u, v. So the dot product would be 0 times 1, which is 0, plus 1 times negative 5, which is negative 5, plus 8 times negative 1, which is negative 8, and we get negative 13. If we had got zero, then yes, they would have been um, orthogonal. But the fact that this does not equal zero tells me that u and v are not orthogonal. Okay. And so then the only other option I can tell them is that these guys are neither parallel nor orthogonal. And so I would select this one. So for number nine, let me first write those vectors in their component forms. OK, and then we're going to find the projection of u onto v. So that's a particular um, formula that we're going to need. 
the projection, I think they usually call it W1, but that's the projection of U onto V. So that's usually how they write it. Sometimes it does not have parentheses, but whenever I say of something, you're, usually that means it's in parentheses. So I always do that, like F of X and the X is in parentheses, right? Um, so that's just my own little thing. When I hear those words, I think parentheses. But normally in the book, they don't have the parentheses, okay? But I do need to follow the formula for that. So it's uh, u dot v over the magnitude of v squared times v, okay? So then in this case, we're going to have uh, 2 times 3, which is 6, plus 5 times 6, which is 30, over, oops, um, the magnitude is going to have a square root, and then the two is going to cancel that square root. So I'm literally just taking this component squared and then this component squared, and then V itself. So I get 36 over, I believe, 45. Yes, and I do not think that that's going to, no, it might reduce. I think it can reduce by three. Oh, more than three. It can reduce by nine. Um, so we end up with four fifths times three six, which is 12 fifths comma 24 fifths. And so let's try that out. It is a vector. So 12 over five comma 24 over five. And then let me check that first because I need to use that value for the second part. And I wanna make sure that this value is correct before I go to do the second part. Um, so yes, it is correct. So then if I wanna find W2, which is normally what we call the other component, um, the vector component of V, I mean, I'm sorry, the vector component of U um, orthogonal to V. Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to say u minus w1. So I'm doing 2, 5 minus these values we just found. So 2 take away 12 over 5 is actually negative 2 fifths. And then 5 take away 24 over 5 is actually 1 fifth. So then I get the vector. negative two fifths comma one fifths. Oops. And we can check that one. Oops, that's still got a two underneath. There we go. Let's see. See, let's see. Yes, another green check. Okay, now Let's go ahead and do this one. I think I can fit it on here, so let's try. So it does give me U and V like that, and it's asking me to find U cross V. Well, U cross V is essentially the determinant of I, J, and K, and then in order, U goes next and then V last. So U is 16, negative nine, zero, and V is negative eight, seven, and zero. So if I go to find my determinant, I'm going to cover this one up. That's zero minus zero. Cover this one up. It's going to be a negative zero plus zero. And then finally here, 16 times seven is going to be one, one, two minus negative eight times negative nine, which is a positive 72. So I get zero, zero, and 40. Now, so I do know the answer to that part. Now it wants me to do u dot with u cross v. So that means u, which is 16, negative 9, 0, is going to dot with what I got for u cross v. So 16 times 0 is 0. 
negative nine times zero is zero and zero times 40 is zero. So I get zero for this result. And then V dot with the cross product. Okay, so V is, what is V? Negative eight, seven, zero. And we're gonna dot product with that same cross product result. So zero comma zero. And so we have negative eight times zero, which is zero, seven times zero, which is zero, and then zero times 40, which is zero. And so notice we took the dot product of U in this thing and we got zero. We took the dot product of V in this thing and we got zero. Remember, if the dot product is zero, then that means that they are orthogonal. So essentially the cross product is obviously orthogonal, orthogonal to U and it's even orthogonal to V because we got zero both times, okay? So for here, we're gonna type in the vector that we received, which was 0, 0, 040. Um, here, when we cross product, we got zero. When we did it again, we got zero again. So it is orthogonal to both. Now let's go ahead and move on to number 11. Oh, that was 11. I'm sorry, did I, did I number it number 11 back here? Why do I have it as number 10? I skipped over a problem, that's why. Okay, oops, we did these out of order. So this is actually number 11, the one we just did with the cross product. I, for some reason, completely scrolled over number 10. So we don't wanna have that one undone Let's go and try to figure that one out. So it is more cross products, which is great. I mean, it's more practice, right? So we're gonna write U in its component form, which would be five I, zero Js and positive seven K. For V, we have positive six I, positive seven J and negative three K. And so for the first part, they want me to find um, U cross with V. So that means I'm going to do the determinant of i, j, and k, and then u goes first, and then v goes last. And so then I'm going to do zero, take away 49, then a negative, but since that's a negative 15, it's actually gonna be a positive 15, and then it would be plus 42, and then finally 35 minus zero. So normally it's this, you go in this direction, you multiply and then it's subtracted that one. But what I do is I change the sign of the result and I use a plus. That's the same as having this negative and then just distributing it right to each term. So I do it a little bit different. It's just backward signs in the middle guys, which in the end we end up with negative 49 um, 57 and 35. Now for part B, it tells me to do V cross U. So again, I'm gonna have the I, the J and the K, but in this time, the V goes next. And then the, I'm sorry, I wrote down the wrong one. I said V and I wrote down U. So V goes first and then the U goes last. And so we'll go for it. That's 49, take away zero. And then here it's negative 42 plus um, a negative 15. And then here it's zero minus 35. So I get 49, negative 57, and negative 35. And then finally, we're gonna do part C, which is V cross V. So V is six, seven, negative three, and then again. So I get negative 21 minus 
um, negative 21. Here I get negative, negative 18 plus, the other way is an 18, negative 18. And then the last one is going to be 42 minus 42. So this turns into a big fat plus, this is a big fat plus, and then these two are big fat minus. So I have negative 21 plus 21, which is zero. And then I have a positive 18 minus an 18, which is another zero. And then 42 minus 42, which is another zero, okay? Um, so there is my responses, but I definitely need to type them in here. So vectors 49, oops, nope, negative 49 comma 57 comma 35. For the second one, it's 49 comma negative 57 comma 30, negative 35. Oh, I have that symbol in there twice. There we go. And then now V cross V is going to be the zero vector. So I'm just going to do bold zero. Let's see instead of doing the components and then zero, zero, zero. Oh, it looks like it doesn't like my zero, zero, zero. Okay, fine. Let's plug it in the long way. So weird that it didn't accept that. Let's try again. Oh, see, it took that. It's exactly the same thing. Um, the hard thing about that is when you're taking the test, you are going to have to type in answers. And if it is the zero vector, you cannot just type in the number zero and bold print it. You can't bold print it on the test. It's just not even an option. Okay. So because I can't bold print it, then you definitely need to make sure that it has, um, that you're using these little arrows, okay? Um, so unfortunately, that's just the way it is in Canvas. You can try, but if you're not allowed to bold print it, make sure you use your, these little symbols to acknowledge that you're doing a vector. Okay, now we went, already went over number 11, so we're gonna go to number 12. And this one says, find the set of parametric equations and symmetric equations of a line through the point parallel to the given vector or line, okay? So we've got a point which is um, negative four, zero, six. And then we've got this vector here, which I'm gonna put in component form. And that's three, three and negative eight, i, j, k coefficients. And so then essentially what we get is we get x equals this x coordinate plus this as my slope for t. Then y equals the y coordinate plus this slope for t. And then z equals the z coordinate um, and it's minus, so minus 8t. Now this can just be written as y equals 3t. So those are my parametric equations. X equals negative four plus three T comma, Y equals three T comma, Z equals six minus eight Z, eight T, there we go. And then for the parametric equations, we're essentially solving for t in each of these. So this one I would divide by three, I get y over three equals t. Here I'm going to subtract six and then divide by negative eight. Here I'm gonna add four and then divide by three. Now this one though, you notice that none of the options have a negative eight. So you can take this negative and decide to put it upstairs. When you do decide to put it upstairs, it applies to the whole numerator, which means it actually distributes to each one. So this is the same thing as saying negative Z and a positive six over a positive eight, which these can be rearranged into six minus Z over eight. 
And since T equals each of these three expressions, those three expressions should be equivalent to each other, which tells me, oh, I made a mistake. Notice my mistake right here. It's three I plus four J, which means this coefficient would be a four. So then this would be a four. And then when I'm solving for T, it would be dividing by four. And so that should be a four. And so that's going to be this top option. Again, something like that is the reason why you want to turn in your paperwork. Obviously, I know what to do and how to do it, but I wrote down the wrong problem, right? So it's super important that I see those steps so I can give you credit for knowing the material. You just made a small error versus you not turning any paperwork in. And then when you type in the answer, either you didn't follow the directions on how to type in the answer or the answer is just incorrect. And I don't know for what reason it's incorrect. Um, then we're at a standstill because you get zero points if you never turned in your paperwork, okay? So this one says, find an equation of the plane that contains all the points that are equidistant from the given point. So this one's a little interesting. I don't think I saw this one in, um, I don't think I saw this one in the homework, okay? However, the clue here is, I know one that in order for me to have the equation of a plane, most times you're gonna have X, Y, and Z, right? Unless something eliminates, that's the only reason why you wouldn't have a certain variable, okay? But technically, usually they have X, Y, and Z. Now, the clue here is that they're equal distant, okay? And the fact that they're equal distant that means that any point that I pick, any point that I pick that's on that plane, any one, they're going to be the same distance from that point that I picked to the red point, and then the same distance from that point that I picked to this black point, okay? So each of these points are equidistant from the given points on that plane, okay? So what that tells me is if I use my distance formula, we have x minus the x coordinate, which is a negative eight squared, plus y minus the y coordinate, which is four squared, plus z minus the z coordinate squared. So that's how I would find the distance. And the fact that they're equal distance means I'm gonna put an equal sign in between these. And if you notice, I have my variables x, y, and z like I would need in this equation. So y minus a negative two squared, and then z minus four squared. So if I do square both sides of this equation, let me grab a pen, right? If I take this side and I square it, and I take this side and I square it, it's basically gonna make the houses go away. Because we know in a plane equation, we shouldn't have any houses anyway, right? So, this is going to become x plus 8 squared, y minus 4 squared, but with no house over any of it. The same thing here. We're going to get x minus 6 squared plus y plus 2 squared, and then z minus 4 squared. Now, you might be wondering, well, these are squared. When I have the equation of a plane, nothing is squared, OK? That will all work itself out as I keep going. So if I square each of these binomials, I will get x squared plus 16x plus 64, y squared minus 8y plus 16, z squared minus 4z plus 4. And I'm just taking this times another one and foiling it out and combining the like terms. I just do it in my head, OK? Here I get x squared minus 12x plus 36. Here I get y squared plus 4y plus 4. Finally, z squared minus 8z plus 16, okay? Now watch what happens. I'm going to have to move everything over to one side. And when I do that, 
let's see how this goes. I'm going to add 12x. I'm going to minus 36. I'm going to minus y squared. I'm going to minus 4y. I'm going to minus 4. I'm going to minus z squared. I'm going to add 8z. And I'm going to subtract 16. OK. Now the x squared, the y squared, and the z squared do cancel. And everything essentially cancels over here because I was using all the opposites, right, to move them over. So I have nothing on the right-hand side now. So this will give me 28x, 64 minus 36 is positive 28. This will give me negative 12y plus 12. This will give me positive 4z minus 12. So these are going to cancel, 12 and negative 12. And I'm going to go ahead and minus this 28 over. So what do I end up with? And let me put the line here too, because I did add those up. Um, I'm essentially going to end up with 28x minus 12y plus 4z equal to negative 28. So let's try to plug that in there. Hopefully, I didn't make any errors. If I did, we can always go back and fix them. It's not that big of an issue when you're doing the review, right? Test is different, but the review is your practice. OK, yay. I did not make an error this time. Good. OK, so number 14. This one can fit here. I have the plane 2x minus y plus z equal to 8. So you want to graph it, and then you want to locate its intercepts. OK, well, I locate the intercepts first algebraically, and then use those intercepts to graph it. OK, so I actually do these in the reverse steps. OK, so I'm going to find the x-intercept first, which means I basically don't know what x is, but I'm going to plug in zeros for y and z. OK, when I do plug in zeros here and here, I'm going to be left with the equation 2x equals 8, which tells me that x equals 4. So then I know that the x-intercept is going to be 4, comma, 0, comma, 0. Now, similarly for the y, I don't know what the y-intercept is, but I'm going to plug in 0 for x and 0 for z, which will leave me with the equation negative y equals 8 which means that y equals negative 8. So then that tells me that the y-intercept is going to be 0, negative 8, 0. And finally, for the z-intercept, I'm going to plug in zeros for x and y and calculate the z-value. So that means those are gone, and I get positive z equal to 8. Well, that implies that the z-intercept is going to be 0, 0, and then 8. And so when I graph this, um, for x is going to be positive 4. For y, it's going to be negative 8. So here they intersect about right there. And then from there, I'm going to go up 8 units. So normally, that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this distance, I'm going to go up, which means my point is about right there. It's in this octave, but it's floating up above it, OK? Eight units up above it, right above this spot. This is like its shadow, OK? OK, so then, um, or no, why am I doing that? I'm not even plotting this correctly. <laughs> I was plotting a point four negative eight eight, right? Not correct. I'm trying to plot intercepts, which means three separate points. So negative 4 for the x, 0 for the y, and 0 for the z. So it's just right here. And then negative 8 for the y, but 0 for the x, and then 0 for the z. So it's just right on top of the y-axis. And then 0 and 8 for the z. So I actually get this plane here. 
And it's in this quadrant where the Z's are negative. I mean, where the Z's are positive, the, the Y's are negative, and the X's are, are positive. Okay, it's this plane right here. It's just a slice of it in that one quadrant that it's in. Okay, so it looks like they take this and they rotated it this way. Okay, so if I take that negative y axis and I rotate it this way, it actually looks like one of these two. And since this one is actually at negative eight for the y value, this one's more like what mine's going to look like. Okay. So this is gonna be my option. Now for the x-intercept, we have four comma zero comma zero. For the y-intercept, we had zero comma negative eight comma zero. And then for the z-intercept, we had zero comma zero comma eight. So let's submit that and see how we do. Yes, we got all four checks. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to number 15. And I think I will stop at 21 just so that we get halfway, okay? Um, actually, I might be able to stop a little bit sooner than that. So for number 15, notice that they have four X squared minus y squared minus z squared equal to one. Now I do wanna point out, I'm just gonna show you real quick that on this, um, this section, where is it? Surfaces in space. This is the one with all the graphs. I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but when I, uh, right below this item, and I don't have it in there yet, I don't have the test in there yet, and I don't have, um, if you go back to modules, I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about, because otherwise I'm just talking. Um, in here, right below this review, before you get to the test, this is just a placeholder for the test, I'm going to put a document in there so you have an idea of the formulas that are gonna be available for you when you take the test. Every formula that I've written down on this review so far is going to be on the test. Any formulas that I did not write down will not be on the test, okay? However, there's a whole bunch of them for 11.6 and I'm not gonna waste the time trying to plug them all in on the paper, okay? So I just wanted you to be aware um, that they are coming from the slide and it has like a whole um, chart and that chart will be available during the test. So if you forget which one looks like which one, um, you will have those extra slides, okay? So let me show you the chart that I'm talking about. It's a big one. So this one here, all of this, so these two, the ep, um, ellipsoid, the hyperboloid of one sheet, the hyperboloid of two sheets, the elliptic cone, the elliptic paraboloid, the hyperbolic paraboloid, those will all be provided. All six of those, okay, will be given to you. So you will have these formulas, you know, to know which way it's going to look, okay? So I don't think I'm going to put all of this trace plane information none of that's going to be available. All you're going to have is this equation and its title, okay? And then possibly one or both of these images next to it, okay? But you're not going to have as much information. Um, but, so that I'm just letting you know what, where I'm getting my information from, because as I go through these problems, you're gonna notice that I know some stuff and why do I know it? Because I have already got that pretty much memorized, but not everyone does. And I'm not expecting everyone to memorize everything right now at the beginning. Um, I'm just letting you know, okay? So what I want to do is I want to write this as um, X squared over one fourth 
minus y squared over one minus z squared over one, which equals one. And so this does fit the description of, um, actually fits a description of a, a hyper, hy I can't say it, hyperboloid, <laughs> hyperboloid of two sheets. We've got two um, subtractions in there, okay? And the one that's positive is where, um, is like the center axis, okay? With X axis as center of, I don't know if you wanna call them cones, domes, whatever you wanna call those images. I've called them both in the past. So essentially what that means is if I try to draw it um, here's my x axis. I'm basically going to have a dome here. And then you're going to have another dome here. I'm trying to draw, but it's hard to draw in 3D. Look, this is like in the back. You can't really tell. Um, it's behind it. Okay. Um, so all you see is just the solid part, but there is like like the flat part to it on the other side. It's more like, like a bowl kind of going this way and then another bowl going that way. Um, but yes, so that is going to look like this. So hyperboloid of two sheets. Now number 15 or 16, I'm sorry. Number 16 is X squared minus Y plus Z squared. So because the Y is not squared, um, Normally, that means it's not going to be the hyperboloids. It could be an ecliptic paraboloid. Uh, la, 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 la. And I think it is a, well, I can't say that word. But anyway, um, no, this one might be a quadratic. So let me go look at that. Notice that my y is not squared, and I do have minus. So it, let's say I were to solve this. If I were to add y over, I would get x squared plus z squared equal to y, which can be written as y equals x squared plus z squared. So I have positives actually, which means it's not the hyperbolic paraboloid, it's the eclip, epil, I can't say that, elliptic, elliptic, um, oh no, extra i. Is TIC paraboloid. Okay. And so then that one basically looks like a three dimensional paraboloid, right? Which is like a giant bowl that gets skinny as the further it goes down. Okay. Um, however, because I have y equals, then that paraboloid is actually um, centered around the y with y axes as center. So if I'm drawing that image in 3D, again, you're gonna have the Y, that's not the Y axis, that's the X axis. But you're gonna have the Y axis as your center of this paraboloid, okay? So the bell shape thing will be around the Y axis. Um, and if I go back over here, that's exactly the image that I have right there. So it's an elliptic paraboloid. I don't think I checked number 15. I should probably check that just to make sure that it is correct. So let's go check this one. And it does look like I got both parts right for number 16. But now let's check number 15. And so it's not necessarily the case that you will get these exact situations. Like this one's a hyperboloid of two sheets. This one's an elliptic paraboloid, right? We don't know what this one is, but you could get any of these things. It doesn't necessarily need to be one of the ones that you're seeing on the review. Just understand that it will be one of those six things that are on that sheet, okay? Um, so number 17, we have 16x squared minus y squared plus 16z squared equal to four. Well, I do know that this either needs to be a one or a zero. So it's not a zero, so chances are it needs to be a one. So I'm gonna divide everybody by four. 
which gives me this. And then I can write that as x squared over 1 fourth minus y squared over 4 plus z squared over 1 fourth equal to 1. Okay. And so then we've got two positives and a minus. That's a one minus means a hyperboloid of one sheet. Okay. And then the um, the one that is negative will be the center of that hyperboloid of one sheet. Now a hyperboloid of one sheet basically looks like a roll, okay? Um, the, I don't even know what they're called. I use them to make tortillas, but I don't remember what it's called. But the rolling pin, I guess that's what I call it, but I know it has another name. Um, but the rolling pin is like that. It's like thinner. Well, if you get the one that doesn't have actual handles, it's like that. So it's, it's, um, it's got a little like dip to it, okay? Um, but you think of it as a roll. So there's only one in here that looks like a little roll, which is this graph here. But see how it gets thinner in the middle? And then it's, it's wider on the sides, okay? That's the hyperbola of one sheet image. And notice that it's centered around that um, y-axis. Okay, so again, if I try to draw it, um, there's my y-axis. It's basically um, where it'll get thinner in the center. I can't draw. I mean, I try, but I can't. <laughs> These images are just awful, but you get the idea. That's what's important, okay? That's why all these things have like multiple choices in here, okay? If on the test, there is no multiple choice, all I might ask you, I might not necessarily ask you to um, draw it. I'll just ask you to describe what kind of quadratic surface it is and then what it would look like. And when I mean what it will look like, I just need to know that um, it where the center is and whether it's gonna look like two cones, one cone, um, a roll that's um, smaller in the center, things like that. A saddle, this one looks like a saddle. This one looks like two cones touching, their, their vertexes are touching. This one, the hyperboloid of two sheets are two cones, but they don't touch, right? This one looks like an egg, that's an ellipsoid. And I think this one is an ellipsoid because we've got plus, plus, and plus. Um, and they're not all the same uh, measurements at the bottom. So this one is the actual egg. And notice that over here, underneath x squared for number 18, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me check number 17. So for number 18, okay, number 17, check out. For number 18, it already has the one, but if you notice that x squared could be written as over one and over one. So this one has a bigger value, which is why the ellipsoid, the egg, looks longer along that y-axis than it does the x and the z-axis, okay? So it's only one unit out um, for the x-axis and then one unit out for the y-axis. I mean, for the Z axis. So one unit up and down, um, one unit front to back, and then, but it's four units. So four units going one side and then four units going the other side. So it does make that egg shape. So this is an ellipsoid. And it basically looks like an egg with the longer part over here. And I cannot, oh, there's no way, I'm not gonna be able to draw a, um, I think I've seen them like that, or tries to make it look like it's 3D, but it just looks ridiculous when I draw it. I can never draw them correctly. So it's an ellipsoid and it looks like an egg. Now let's try 19, which I believe I can fit in here. And we still have a few more. So it's a pretty good mix of all of the different possible combinations. So here we have x squared minus y squared plus z equal to zero. So if I move these guys over, I will have z equal to positive y squared minus x squared. 
So what does that mean it's going to look like? Um, I think when you have a minus, it looks like the saddle. Yes, it does. Okay. And then the positive variable minus y squared as well, just like this image, it means that the saddle is going to wrap around that y axis. So mine is the same thing. Notice that this saddle wraps around the y axis. Okay. So a saddle is called a hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, so this is a hyperbolic. Paraboloid wrapped, and it's basically like a saddle wrapped around the y axis because it's the positive variable here. Okay, so here again, I'm awful at drawing, but I could try. You basically have a parabola over, parabola over, and then in the center, it's going down to the center. It's like a little dip. It's so strange. I cannot draw this. I cannot. There's just no way. I don't. That looks like nonsense. <laughs> I'm trying, but I can't. I'm just so glad there's multiple choices here. Let's check it. It takes me a long time to draw things. I can't even. I can paint. And I can uh, get images to look correctly, even three-dimensional images, but it takes me a really long time to get it right. And a lot of erasing if I'm having to do it with pencil. Um, let's look at Z at number 20. So number 20 says Z squared equals X squared plus Y squared over nine. Um, this one is not quite the way it should look. All my variables should be on one side when they're squares. So I do have one of them with a minus. And when you do have one of them with a minus, that means you're going to have an elliptic cone, which is the situation where the two cones are touching, okay? Um, and then the variable that has the uh, negative is going to be the center of those cones, okay? So this is the one with the Z axis as the center. So if I try to draw it, you're basically gonna have a cone going this way and then a cone going this way um, again, I cannot draw. That's like behind this solid piece that you see here. It's like in the back. Um, but they're two cones, but they touch one another. Okay. And there are the centers around the Z axis. Now I do see two of them like that. So we really have to be able to decide which one's which, but it looks like this one hits like below the X, the below the origin. And this one, they touch at the origin. They should be touching at an origin because I don't have any numbers added or subtracted inside here. The only way things are going to get shifted around left, right, up, down is if I had like x minus one squared, then it would be going, the whole thing would be moving over here one unit, okay? But I don't have anything in those parentheses, so it should be centered at the origin. So those little guys should be happening at the origin, which tells me it's this graph, elliptic cone. Okay, yes. Now I am going to finish. Hmm. We will go, we'll go up to number 25, just because that's the end of chapter 11. And then it starts going into chapter 12. So I will finish this video with all of the chapter 11 stuff. And then we'll start another video with all of the chapter 12 stuff. So for 21, we've got the point seven square root of two negative seven square root of two comma five. And what they're saying is that they want you to convert this rectangular coordinate point into cylindrical coordinates. So that means this is currently X, Y, and Z. 
And what they want is they want um, R, beta, and Z. Well, I already know Z. That's pretty easy. It's just five. That's not changing. It's Z here and it's Z here. So that value is exactly the same. But for R, I know that um, X equals R cosine theta. Um, da, 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 da. Nope, we can use another formula to find R. Actually, we can use the fact that X squared plus Y squared equals R squared. So R equals the square root of X squared plus Y squared, which in this case is seven square root of two squared plus negative seven square root of two squared, which is 49 times two, 98 plus 98. So I get 196 and then the square root of 196 is just 14. So I do get that the radius is 14. Now for theta, that is 10 inverse of y over x. So we get 10 inverse of negative seven square root of two over positive square root seven square root of two, which gives me 10 inverse of one, which I believe if you type in the calculator is um, 10 inverse of one, is four, I'm in degree mode, so it's 45 degrees. But if I change my mode into radians, I am divide by pi, a fourth of pi. So this is pi over four. This is only a reference angle. And what is a reference angle? If you remember from pre-cal, it's basically how far away from the um, x axis it is. So I don't know if that means it's pi over four here, if it's pi over four here, pi over four here, or pi over four there. All I know is that that's the reference angle, okay? So it really does help to know which quadrant you're in to be able to decide what's going on, okay? If it were in this quadrant, then it would be, the angle would be exactly pi over four. However, if the point is over here in this quadrant on the xy plane, of course, um, we're not talking about what's happening in the z plane. Um, if I were in this quadrant in the xy plane, then the angle would be um, a hundred or pi minus this pi over four. And then if I were down here, it would be theta equals pi plus pi over four because it's pi and then a little bit more, right? And over here, the angle in this quadrant would be two pi minus pi over four. So it all depends on what uh, quadrant I'm in. So if I'm looking at these two guys, right, just the um, x, y plane, the x is positive, so that puts me over here on this side to the right, and the y is negative, which puts me down here. So I am actually in this quadrant here. So what is going to be my angle? Whatever two pi minus pi over four is. And I actually get seven pi over four. That could also be written as negative pi. Um, it just depends on the angle that they want here. So we'll see if they'll accept seven pi over four, but if they don't, they may just want negative pi over four. But let's try. So 14 comma seven pi over four comma five. It did accept seven pi over four. Okay, great. So now we're gonna move on to 22. So for 22, it says you have an equation and they want you to write it in cylindrical coordinates. Well, remember in cylindrical coordinates, this just means R squared. And you can't really do anything else with that. So I think that's pretty much what they want. So z equals r squared minus two. Yep, I did accept that. Okay, now 23. 
has two zero zero and they're asking for spherical coordinates which means they want it in row theta phi okay and so we definitely need to remember our uh, formulas for that one that one's a little bit harder so the first formula i need to know this is x y and z first formula is that rho equals the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared so in this case that's four plus zero plus zero which is just two so i know that rho is equal to two now um for Theta, theta is the same. It's going to be 10 inverse of y over x. So I get 10 inverse of 0 over 2, which is 10 inverse of 0. And 10 inverse of 0 is 0. OK, now that's, again, a reference angle. So I could either be over here or I could be over here. Okay, it depends on this point. And 200, zero, zero, if I just look at the xy plane, is over here on this side. So it is in fact zero. So I have zero for theta instead of pi. Now, if I want to find phi, that's actually the cosine inverse of um, the z coordinate over a rho. And I've already calculated rho. So cosine inverse z is 0, and rho was 2. So it's just the cosine inverse of 0, which is going to be pi over 2. OK, so then what is my coordinates? These are going to be my coordinates, 2, 0, and pi over 2. 2 comma 0 comma pi over 2. And let's check it. We've got two more. So 24 has the point 8 pi over 6 and pi over 4. Um, and they want me to put this in x, y, and z, OK? So remember, if it's in spherical coordinates, this is rho, this is theta, and this is phi, OK? And so for rho, I know that, let's see. Oh, I think there's formulas. OK, more formulas. So x will equal 8 sine of um, phi cosine of theta. And then y is, why did I put 8? I don't know. It's because I'm using that number already. It's rho. Rho sine phi cosine theta. y is rho sine phi uh, sine theta. And then z is the rho cosine of phi. OK, so if I use all of these um, angles here, then let's see what we get. So I will get x equal to 8 sine of pi over 4 cosine of pi over six. And a calculator should help me with that. Let me see, eight sine pi over four cosine of pi over six. And I get two square root of six. And then y is eight sine of pi over four sine of pi over six. And I get 2 square root of 2. And then z is going to be 8 cosine of phi, which is pi over 4. And I get 4 square root of 2. 
So what is the point? The point is two squared is six, two squared is two, and four squared is two. So two squared is six, um, two squared is two, and then four squared is two. And let's check. Oops, I got too many square roots in there. There we go. Okay, so now we have 25x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 5z equal to zero. And they want me to put this in spherical coordinates, okay? Well, I do know that all of this is rho squared. And I know that z by itself is rho cosine of phi. And so I can factor out a rho And then we have rho equals zero and rho minus cosine of phi equals zero. Now this one doesn't make sense. If rho equals zero, that means that the length of um, how far out I'm going is going to be zero, which means all the points, no matter what theta and, and phi are, are gonna be at the origin. So this is definitely not a general graph, okay? It's just a point at zero, zero, zero. However, this one, if I add five cosine phi over, this could vary depending on what phi is, okay? So when I come in here, I need my Greek symbols. I need to put rho equals five trig function cosine, and then my Greek again, and I'm gonna put phi. There we go. And let's try it. Yes, it is correct. So I'm going to stop the video here because it is already very lengthy. Um, and I will resume part two in a little bit where we'll go through 26 through the rest of 42.